Thank you for joining us for this message from More Life Church, where we exist to love God, to love people, to reach a region for Jesus, and to make a difference for generations to come. Now, to learn more about how we're reaching our community and how you can partner with us and learn how God has uniquely designed you, check out Grow Steps On Demand by visiting morelifechurch.com slash growsteps or by downloading our app today. But now, enjoy today's message. I want to share a message with you today as uh, we wrap up this series called Giftology. And we've talked a lot about the motivation gifts from Romans chapter 12. We talked about the manifest- manifestation gifts in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. And today we're going to talk about uh, some gifts that are often overlooked, tucked away in Ephesians chapter 4. I've entitled today's message, Five Expressions of Jesus. Five Expressions of Jesus. And I want to, I want to share this um, because these gifts are the gifts that equip believers for growth, both spiritually and the church numerically. That's why we need to look at these five gifts in Ephesians chapter 4. Now, many of you know me, and um, if you've been around and on a path with us for any length of time, you know that I'm not the kind of guy who talks a lot about the devil, I don't believe we ought to give him a whole lot of airtime because he's a defeated foe. Jesus has gotten the victory for us. We stand in a place of victory because Jesus, he says, his word says, he always causes us to triumph. So we need to come at every battle with victory in mind, knowing he's never lost a battle and he's not going to start today with you. He never fails. He never loses, and we've been made more than conquerors through him who loved us. Somebody say amen to that. But I I want to bring your attention to something, and I shared that about Alex first because I'm not a devil lives behind every tree and inside of every shrub kind of preacher, but I do want to say something that I want you to be made aware of, that the enemy is strongly attacking leaders right now in a bunch of different areas and avenues of life, especially in the church. And I want us to talk about these five gifts that Jesus gives because if they're diminished within the church and they lose their voice in our lives or if they've never gained a voice in our life, if these expressions don't capture our heart, we will never reach the full potential that God has intended for us to reach. And so in our community, there have been several pastors in the last month who have just had terrible tragedy hit their lives. Dear friends of mine, um, Corbin Huffman, who pastors an incredible church called Life Change, he was in a very scary accident not too many weeks ago. And is, is, it's a miracle that he's alive. His spinal cord was severed. It, I don't know the medical term, but the description was a decapitation of the spinal cord. That doesn't sound good, ladies and gentlemen. But God is doing a work. And I, I'm telling you that the enemy is working overtime to rob us of the voice of spiritual leaders because the enemy knows that these voices will help get us from where we are to where God wants us to be. And the enemy is terrified of people who will stand up, speak the truth, speak loud, speak clear, and encourage and lift the body of Christ. And so we have to be vigilant about this. My friend, Josue, who pastors um, Family of Faith Community Church, he is, um, he is from Cuba. And uh, their nation, his nation, has been riddled with all kinds of challenge and disaster. And it's, it's affected him emotionally and mentally and fatigued him to no end, and, and he's doing better, but it's been weighing on him. My dear friend Dave Warner, who pastors Engage, downtown Newark, he's having surgery tomorrow. There are thing after thing after thing of people right here in Licking County that the enemy is trying to stop 
what God has started. And I just came here to tell you and to put everyone on notice, including the devil himself, you cannot stop the power of the local church and you will not have your way in this house or any other. Someone says, aren't you afraid that the devil will hear you and just start working overtime? No, I'm not afraid. I said it for his benefit. My Bible says I have authority over anything of the devil's plan, and God will come through over and over and over again for us. And so these five expressions are how we get the most out of our church. We learn from these five expressions how to get the most out of our church and how to give the most out of our church. In Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to begin reading at verse 11. And I'm just going to do kind of a verse at a time, stop, share some things, and then go. Uh, before, before I do that, um, when our daughter, our youngest daughter, Audrey, was growing up, she had, um, she had a really... She was, when she was developing in her speech, she, um, she was so cute in how she said things. And um, when it came to food, uh, she developed this language. And I don't know how it came about, but she used two words to describe the food that she was given. And would ask ahead of time if it was one of two things. So uh, sometime, I, I think... When she was younger, I think I gave her like a spicy item that was too much for her and she didn't like it. And so from then on, anything like that that she didn't enjoy, she labeled as spicy. <laughs> she couldn't say spicy, she'd say, that too spicy. <laughs> and then if she found something she liked, she'd say, that's ummy. So then when we would give her something, she would ask. She got, she smartened up, and she's like, that ummy or that Pisces? <laughs> I say that to you because I don't know if today is going to be ummy or Pisces for you, but either way, it's going to be good for all of us, all right? And so it could be ummy, it could be Pisces. I guess it depends on your palate. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 says this. And he himself, the he there is Jesus. This verse, Paul writing to the church at Ephesus is saying, he himself, he, it would be not adding to the text to say, and, and Jesus himself gave some. So the first thing I want you to see is these five expressions of Jesus that we're going to look at, they were given to the church by Jesus who is the head of the church. And these five expressions are gifts from Jesus to his body. How many think Jesus knows how to give good gifts? Yes. So he gives these gifts, and listen to them, and he gave some, Jesus gave some, to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. Now, I'm up against the tremendous momentum of tradition and belief that would say all five of these expressions are not relevant to the church today. In fact, there would be a whole group of people who would say some of these gifts have been done away with and are no longer necessary. I just want you to know that I don't find that to be an accurate interpretation of this scripture. We need all five of these expressions of Jesus for the church to reach its potential. Now, I know I'm also up against a tremendous momentum of this, that most people are very comfortable with the title pastor or teacher or even evangelist. But there are five that Jesus says are paramount to the equipping of the saints and for the doing of the work of ministry in the church. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. So let me give you, very quickly, five descriptive words that show you this expression of Jesus and how he has designed these gifts to equip the church. You ready? First, the apostle. He or she governs. The prophet 
guides. The evangelist gathers, the pastor guards, and the teacher grounds. What I want you to do is to think with me for a moment and get away from title authority because God's system of leadership never evokes title or positional authority. He uses functional authority. I would suggest to you that these five were never meant to be titles that someone put on the outside of their office or on their business card or on the marquee of the sign outside. These are functional gifts that are meant to do something to help the believer reach maturity. And since we have not reached that place, which we'll get to in a moment, we still need all of these in function. So the apostle governs, the prophet guides, the evangelist gathers, the pastor guards, and the teacher grounds. Now, here's what's interesting. We as a church and we as believers, we impose on the leader, that would be me in this context, or the leadership, which would be the staff, we impose on those individuals what we think we need and we build a level of expectation around our need rather than building our expectation based upon the gift that God has set in the church through that leadership structure. Now, I know I'm teaching just a little bit, but let me, let me break it down for you. If you come here and you expect to receive from me the role of pastor as defined by me on guarding, if you're looking for a kumbaya, always care, know everything about you, your favorite color, your birthday, and all those care type items, you're going to be greatly disappointed. What I need you to understand is I can't be what you need me to be. I've got to be what God has assigned me to be. That's that's what's in your best interest. Just like you can't be to others what they want you to be or need you to be, you need to be who God has designed you to be. And so when I say that, I want you to understand this, that that guardian role is important. But I just want you to see that any of these functions can be leadership in a local church. The challenge has been, I'm up against a tremendous momentum of, we've labeled everyone who does what I do as one of the five expressions. And therefore, we've limited God because we've said, I only want 20% of Jesus. I only want one-fifth. And what I want to do is I want to ask God if he'll help us see beyond this. This functional authority is important that we understand. I can only be what I'm designed to be. My spiritual father, uh, he, he described it this way. He said, you can sit in a, car, in a garage and call yourself a car all day long. It don't make you one. Anybody ever had the unfortunate experience of going to your cabinet and going for a can of food and the label's missing? You ever had that happen? Hasn't, it hasn't happened to me for a while, but I went, to the, I went to the cupboard wanting a certain thing and there was no label on it. And it didn't matter how much I wished. It didn't matter how much I talked to that can. No matter what I did, it did not affect the contents of that can because the contents of that can had already been predetermined by the manufacturer and there was no amount of wishing that I could do to change what was inside of that can. The same thing is true for us that we have got to understand that God sends us what we need even if we don't think at the moment that's what we need. And that's what he does in these five expressions. And um, I want to say this. You might want to write this down if you're taking notes, and I'm going to move quickly after this. You receive from God in direct proportion to the honor you give the one he sent. I want to say it again. You receive from God in direct proportion to the honor you give to the one or ones he sent. 
You're going to get the most out of people by honoring who they are, not who you want them to be. Let me move on. Ephesians chapter 12, keep on reading. These are given, these five expressions are given for what purpose, Paul? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. This is the why. This is why he gives them. He gives these gifts so that these gifts can equip the people to do the work of ministry. We've got this so flip-flopped in the American rural church. What we think God does is he sends us leaders so the leaders do the work. The leaders go and pray for the sick. The, the leaders go and visit those people who are in need of care. The leaders are the ones who got to pray for me and all these things. That All those things are good, but listen, the assignment of these five that Jesus gives the church is to not to do the work, but to equip you to do what you're called to do. Thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> I guess I could say it this way that I would borrow from someone else. My job is to get you off your blessed assurance and step into the calling that God has given to your life. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. This is why because he wants us doing something. I've spoken to you over and over this summer about everyone being involved, serving, getting involved. Why? Serving is the training wheels for you stepping into the fullness of what God has called you to do. I hear people say all the time, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what God wants me to do. I've heard this so many times over the last 20 years. I just, I just don't know what God's plan for me is. Well, all the while, they're sitting there doing nothing. And you can't figure it out by staying stationary. Eventually, you've got to act. You've got to do something. Even if you fail, even if you make a mistake, you do it with the right heart and say, hey, I'm going to try this. I'm going to get involved there. I'm going to do that. That's how you learn, grow, and develop as a believer. Am I helping anybody? Yeah. Okay. Um, I feel like I just made a bogey. Sorry, goal, bad golf reference. I want to I bring this out from the story of the children of Israel. And I, wanna, I want you to write this down if you want to. Your authority extends to the limit of your responsibility. Your authority extends to the limit of your responsibility. In other words, if you have no responsibility, you don't have any authority in that area. Let me say it differently. If you don't have any responsibility, give up your right to an opinion about it. Yeah, that's good. Help him, Jesus. I was waiting for someone. Help him, Lord. Come on now. Don't have an opinion where you don't have responsibility. Can I just be honest with you? I don't think we need anybody else with professional opinions who are sitting on the sidelines doing jack squat. When we, boy, got really quiet in here and dead on that, but I'm going to say it again. We have, listen, because here's what we become, professional at having an opinion. If you don't have any responsibility in that area, God will never give you authority in that area. It's what you do with what God told you that matters. We have this manna mentality. When the Jewish people were leaving Egypt, and we, we hear the story of God rained down manna from heaven. How many of you know that story? That God provided. I want to read to you what that actually looked like. Because too many people have the impression that when God sent them manna, what that meant was they went out, they picked the food, and they ate it, and they went on, and God did it. That's not how it worked. Did you know that? That's not how it worked. Numbers chapter 11, verse 7 says this. Now the manna was like coriander, like a coriander seed. And its color like the color of delium. The people, listen, verse 8. The people went about and gathered it. They ground it on millstones or beat it in the mortar. Cooked it in pans 
and make cakes of it, and its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. They had to do something with what God sent. In other words, when viewed properly, ingredients are as good as a meal, but you got to do something with it. I've told you this story, but this, this, this bears repeating right here that our kids, um, they, would, they, would, they would be notorious for coming to us. They still do it. Come to us and say, there's nothing in this house to eat. I just spent $11,000 at the grocery store. I know there's food in this house to eat. What you mean, let me educate you a little bit. What you mean is there's nothing that you can take out of the refrigerator, put into the microwave for 30 seconds, sit down and eat a full course meal already prepared. What you mean is there's nothing in this house that's convenient. But I got news for you. If you'll take those potatoes and you'll boil them, and then you smash them up a little bit and you add some butter and some salt and some pepper. If you take that frozen meat and you put it on the counter for a few hours and then you put it on the smoker at 250 for about 16 hours, <laughs> you'll have you something really, really, really good. You want to step into the plan of God for your life? Get the thing out of the freezer, put it on the counter and get it ready to be put in a place where God can do something with it. Yeah. We've got this fast food mentality. We've got this microwave mindset. And I just want you to know, God doesn't know anything about microwaves. He likes crock pots and smokers. <laughs> and it makes me mad. I can either fight against him or I can cooperate with him. I'm saying all that to say that if you're waiting for a sign to get involved and to activate your gift, this is your sign. This is your moment. Those ingredients you have will make a full-blown meal. Now, that's exactly how some of you feel on the inside right now. I know it. It's an outward expression of an inner work. No, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. So, so Jesus gave the gifts. Why did he do it? To equip us. Uh, verse 13 to come against the, the doctrinal position of these have been done away with. Apostles, prophets, some of these have been done away with. This is what Paul says. These are in place, watch this. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. This is how long they're lasting. These expressions are here. Until we all come to the unity of the faith. Until and to the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Paul is saying... We must have these gifts in our churches until we look just like Jesus. And I have news for us as a church and the church universal. We are just not there yet. So let's be open to all of these expressions working in our lives and think about areas. Where do I need to be governed? Where do I need to be guided? How, do, do I need to be used to gather some people? Is God going to use us to guard and ground? So on and so forth. Verse 11 or verse 14. Why? So we've looked at who gave them, what they're for, how long they last. And Paul then tells us in verse 14 that we should... No longer, this is why they're there. So we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Oh man, I want to say something about that. We live in a very crafty environment in the world we live in, ladies and gentlemen. And yielding to all of the gifts that God has given will be your protection from deception. Yes. That's good. Because there is a spirit that wants to deceive. Have you noticed there's been a growing and building sense of we don't even know what's right. We don't know what's true. We live in a world of fact checkers and so on and so forth. Listen, when you stay close to the gifts that God has given you, this is a protection from deception, watch this, why? So that we would speak the truth in love. 
As we speak the truth in love, it's an expression, he says, of growing up into all things into him who is the head Christ, whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share. That's why I've said I will not rest until everyone who calls us home, everyone who receives from the ministry of this church is actively engaged serving somewhere. That's my job. That's, what, that's my assignment. And to get every part, to encourage every part, to pray for every part, to do their share. And why? Because this causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. In Numbers chapter 11, it's a very interesting passage. And it's, it won't be on screen, but I'm going to close with this. So they just, made the, they just made the manna. And the people were complaining. The people were upset. And verse 1 of Numbers chapter 11 says this. Now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. I, I just want to let you know. Complaining still displeases the Lord. Amen. Young people, complaining displeases the Lord. Don't do it. Old people, <laughs> y'all got your black belt and complaining you've had lots of years of experience. It's, listen, listen, it displeases the Lord. People in the middle, complaining displeases the Lord. How about you go on a complaining fast for the next 24 hours as a challenge? Go the next 24 hours without complaining about anything, no matter how bad it gets. Because no matter how bad it gets, complaining is optional. Man. Thank you. I don't know who said it, but I appreciate it. Maybe you ought to have Josh back next week, the other Josh. No, I'm teasing. I'm going to be here next week. We're going to have fun. Let me finish with this idea. Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of the tent, and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses was also displeased. In verse 11 of Numbers 11. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight? That you, he's talking to God, that you have laid the burden of all these people on me. Hundreds of thousands. He feels the weight of it. Listen to what Moses says. He gets really sassy. Did I conceive these people? Did I beget them? That you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to these people? For they weep all over me saying, give us meat that we may eat. Verse 14, I am not able to bear all these people alone. Say alone. I'm not able to bear all these people alone, he says. Because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, this is what Moses' prayer was. Please, kill me. Here and now. He's in the midst of heartache, heavy stress, discontent. The people around him are so frustrated that they're saying, we want to go back to Egypt. It was better for us there. I want you to understand that the wrong mindset will always want to go back to a place of bondage that God set you free from because you know it and you're comfortable with it and you're familiar with it. Amen. And God says, no, 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 don't do that. It's not better back there. That's a lie. That's a lie to think that it's better back in Egypt. They said it's better for us to go back to Egypt because they didn't have steak or quail or whatever serving they wanted that afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, they were deceived. They, they were deceived. It wasn't better back in Egypt. 
They didn't even own themselves in Egypt. They were slaves, and God brought them out. And, and Moses is dealing with the same pressure day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And verse 17, I said, everything I've said to you to get us to this place that I believe God wants to land in our hearts. Verse 17, this is what God says in response. Then, he says, I will come down and talk with you there. I will take of the spirit that's upon you, Moses, and I will put the same spirit upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, that you may not bear it yourself alone. You are God's answer for a, for a plurality of leadership and serving that he wants to explode all over the planet. You are the answer. He's saying, you are the answer. You are the answer. Getting involved, stepping into it, and watch as God uses you to lift the burdens of those around you. See how it starts with someone who will lead, someone who will take the shot, someone will stick, who will stick their head above the foxhole and lead the charge and say, hey, you see that mountain? We're going to go get it. And God says, when you do that, I'll take the same spirit that's on that person that you're following, and I'll put a measure of that same attitude spirit inside of you, and you are well able to conquer the land. This is why I believe the enemy is so intent on attacking leaders right now because he knows that it's through them that God helps get things to us that we would not get otherwise. I just want to pray over you. I hope this is, I hope that in the days and, and weeks to come, this makes sense. I believe that this is key for us. What are the action steps you might be asking? Some of the action steps are really straightforward. Take a step today. Take a risk just in your heart and say, I'm going to get involved in an area. Ask God, what is it that you're trying to send me through leaders that are in my life? What are you trying to send me? And God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to receive what's sent with honor because I know it's from you to me. This has been such a key in my life. Father, I just ask you right now to just do the thing that is reserved for you to do. We've come and we've worshiped with our heart through song. We've worshiped and honored you with our attention and our time by saying, Lord, I want to know what your word says to me. And Father, we just um, give you thanks beyond measure. Thanks again for joining us for this message from More Life Church. Now, if this message spoke to you, we would love for you to share this message with someone you think could use it. And Finally, if you would like to partner financially with More Life Church, you can do that by visiting morelifechurch.com give. Now have an amazing day.